I used to make fun of AJ for all his aches and pains, and now I'm getting the very same ones I made fun of him for, you know. But AJ was with me about a year, man, and he says to me, said he called me boss. He said, boss, I think I got it now. I said, what do you mean? He said, I think I understand this Bible. I, th I think I got it. I said, you got it in a year? He said, yeah, man, I think I got it. I said, what? What do you think? He said, man, I think it's about gang wars. I said, well, I remember some churches like that, but I don't remember any place in the Bible talked about gang wars, you know. And he said, yeah, that was right there behind the book of Malachi. I said, you mean Malachi? He said, yeah, Malachi, that, that Italian dude. And I said, what do you mean? He said there was this group of guys, they was the Jews named the Pharisees, and they was fighting these Italians named the Sadducees. I said, you mean the Pharisees and the Sadducees? He said, yeah. I said, man, i got to buy you a Bible, dude. So I get him a Bible, man, and he is like, uh, you know, he's starting to read. He gets stuck. I'm just telling a little story here to get started. But he's, he gets stuck in Pittsburgh. We were flying to Yuma, Arizona. His flight gets delayed. And mine was, I was flying from, uh, from Baltimore, connected to Phoenix. I was going to meet him in Phoenix. He was coming from Pittsburgh. We were going to fly together into Yuma. He misses his flight, so he's going to be real late coming in this night. So he said he got stuck there in Pittsburgh, and he said he realized I got seven, eight hours waiting on my next flight. He said, I got that Bible in my case that Lynn bought me. I think I'm going to pull that bad boy out and just read it a little bit. So he said, I started reading in Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2, and he said, man, I grabbed my Bible, throw it back in my suitcase, and I looked around to hope nobody seen me read that thing. And so he comes in that night, and he's got this real distraught look on his face. And when he walked through the door, he said, I'm unclean. I'm unclean. I said, brother, what is wrong with you? He said, have you read this book before? I said a couple times. And you got to know AJ, but he goes like, he goes, you know, boss, you know, I got your back, right? I, I, you're my homeboy, you know. And he said, you know, I got your back. I said, I believe you take a bullet for me, dude. He said, listen, man, he said, if you're scamming the people, I'm still with you. <laughs> I said, well, I appreciate your loyalty. <laughs> to this day, he's still the most loyal friend I've got. It's actually on my board of directors. He said, if you're, if you're scamming the people, I'm still with you. I said, well, I appreciate your loyalty, but what are you concerned about? He said, man, I said, what you read? He said, Romans chapter 1. In chapter 2, I said, how far did you get? He said, about halfway through chapter 2. He said, that's all I could take. I was guilty of five death penalties. <laughs> he said, I'm doomed. I'm done. I, he said, man, do you ever read this book of Donoronomy? You know, I called it Donoronomy. He called. He said, man, I, there is stuff there. First, he, when he first got with me, he's like, he's like this. He's been, when I first time I preached on Moses and the Ten Commandments and stuff like that, he said, you mean that's in the Bible? He said, I saw that movie, Charlton Heston, started in that. He didn't even know it was in the Bible, man, you know. So, I, I mean, I talk about it come from nothing. And so he says to me, man, he says, I, I think, you're, I, I think you're, you're preaching this message of grace, man. And you're preaching this God that's good. Man, this Romans 1 and 2, it indicts everything and everybody. It starts out by talking about when they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God. And there's no excuse for him because the heavens declare night unto night. They utter speech and they're everything that's created screaming God. And nobody nowhere that God hadn't somehow spoke to in some form or some fashion. And then it goes down there and starts talking about when they knew God, they wouldn't glorify him as God and they turn themselves over to vile affections and they worship and serve the creature more than the creator and he gets into this whole list of whole stuff that they're all doing wrong and uh, you know and then but what it does is then in chapter 2 he starts to see chapter 1 he indicts outsiders non-Jewish not believing nobody close to religion and he indicts everything and everybody that you can imagine and then he turns on the holy dudes that's what I like to call them and he says you insiders especially if you read it in the message Bible he said you think you got a special deal with God, but you don't realize something. You're just in as bad a shape as these people that you think you're better than they are. Because here's the point. Here's the deal. See, uh, I don't know if you even know this term, but since I've been on TV, I've been called stuff that I, I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> Somebody asked me, and they said, are you antinomianism? And I said, I don't, that sounded to me like a Star Wars thing. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I'm one of them, but you got to tell me what it is. You know, they ask you to pick, they, got, they want to get labels for you. And I said, what's an antinomianism? They said, it's somebody that hates the law. I said, we're not haters of the law. The Bible said that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. But it's not for the righteous. See, that's what Paul told Timothy. That the law is not for the righteous, but it's for the sinner and the ungodly. Now watch this point here. In other words, how many, know the, how many of you are believers in here? Let me just see your hand for a moment. 
See, if you're a believer in Jesus, the Bible says that you are righteous, not based on your performance, but based on a gift. Because of the abundance of grace, now see, I feel the preacher sneaking up on me now. Hallelujah. Because of the abundance of grace, watch this, and the gift of righteousness. Touch somebody, say, what part of gift don't you understand? You didn't do nothing to earn this. This grand setting everything right, another translation says, God made you right on the basis of what you sang tonight. He that knew no sin, he that did absolutely nothing wrong on his part, was made to be sin for us. So that I who did absolutely nothing right could be made righteous with the same made. He was made sin. He was made sin. I was made righteous. I'm righteous if I never do a righteous thing. I, I, and, and that's not volatile. It's not optional. It's a gift that God never takes back. It's this grand setting thing, everything right that God did through his son Jesus when he offered him once and for all for your past, your present, and your future sin. So he made you righteous. How many believe that? So then the law is not for you. That's what the scripture said not for a righteous man and so the so, so then people said to me well y'all you, here's the law and, and so i said here's the whole deal what we need to understand is that the law has a purpose and when aj come through the door totally distraught totally just tore up but i mean he's ready he said i about threw myself off a cliff out there i said well i'm glad you came to the room first he said because i'm doomed i'm done he said i thought about just jumping off a cliff out there he said i thought <laughs> i said man i got <laughs> You got to, before you jump on question, before you kill anybody, shoot somebody, you know, come talk to me a minute. And so he, he, he comes in, I said, how far did you get? He said, chapter two. I said, I want you to sit down right here on the bed tonight before we go to sleep, and I want you to read chapter three, because one and two is a setup for chapter three. Because what he does is he tells you that the purpose of the law includes all under sin. So that he can have mercy on all. In other words, he indicts both outsiders and insiders, goody two shoes. Come on. Everything from, listen, everything that you can imagine. The good guys, the bad guys, the Jews, the Gentiles. He said, here's the, here's the end of the story. The end of the law is there is none righteous. No, not even one. There's not one that does good. It's all. You're all. He, and the Bible said the purpose of that was so that he could conclude all under sin so that he could have mercy on all. What we don't understand is that not even Moses, the mediator of that covenant made it in to the promised land based on the works of the law because God was trying to show us that under that covenant nobody makes it in not even the mediator so if the mediator of that covenant if Moses didn't make it in homeboy don't got a snowball's chance it used to tick me off I, I, can, can I talk like that <laughs> that's probably real mild right you know, I used to think about Moses. Here's this dude, man. He, 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 he served God his whole life. He spent 40 years in Egyptian schools training to be the Pharaoh of Egypt. He was the heir apparent to the throne of Ramesses. But he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin, which means missing the mark for a season. Actually, you know, let me just sidetrack here a little bit. The Lord spoke to me when I was at Tulsa a few months ago, and he said to me, you can choose to stay in the plushness of of Pharaoh's palace and keep my people in bondage. Now, how many know that's what would happen if Moses would have chose to become the Pharaoh of Egypt? Because he was the heir apparent to the throne of Ramesses. He was being groomed for that. He said, you could choose to, see, sin means to miss the mark. It's not just a bad deed. You could choose to miss the mark and sit in the plushness of Pharaoh's palace and keep my people in bondage. Watch this. This the Lord spoke this to me. It may not mean nothing to nobody else. Or you can embrace your true identity as a deliverer. And in order to do that, you've got to leave the palace and, and go on a 40-year camping trip with three to six million people to want to go camping. Now, I don't know if this is a, this is a tough decision here. 
But the Bible said he did it because, and he spent, he left the throne and the palace and the plushness and spent another 40 years in the backside of the desert getting sheep crap on him. Is that all right to use that word? If you, here's the, the Greek word for skabola, if you want to know. Yeah, yeah. And I got a bumper sticker that says skabola happens. You better get this microphone out of my hand. I might be, a, there's an ornery spirit on me here tonight. Hallelujah. But, but man, he gets sheep crap on him. He's learning how to be a pastor. Now he's 80 years old. God calls the dude to go into ministry. Touch somebody says, not too late for you yet. He was 80 when he went into ministry because he embraced his identity as a deliverer because what he did, he saw an Egyptian smiting one of his brothers and he rose up and killed that Egyptian because what was in him, what was in his nature, was in his calling, was to bring deliverance and set people free rather than to keep them in bondage. Now I'm going to tell you that the Bible said he did that because he had respect to the recompense of a reward. And the thing that really hit me when I was in Tulsa, the Lord said, you can choose to set the, and the plushness of the palace and you can, you can preach the big platforms. There's nothing wrong with big. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But I tell you what, I got to the place where I said, you know what? I am tired of the fluff. I'm tired. Uh, I'm tired, man. I really am of the whole fake, the whole plastic religious system that wants to look at somebody else and say, I thank God I'm not like that sinner because we are all sinners from the pulpit to the door until Jesus does something to make us righteous. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And I've decided to preach a message that's not so popular and, and, and embrace my identity as a deliverer. And sometimes that doesn't make you popular. It makes you live in a tent. living in the palace no more he on a 40-year camping trip with three to six million people who don't want to go camping these are not happy campers and these are not your everyday common three to six million you think it's tough pastoring a hundred people what if you took three to six million people camping for 40 years in a desert they would get on your last nerve. And these people are not your common everyday belly acres. They're the kind of people going to whine and cry about. Listen, they didn't just say it's hot out here. He stole my stint, tent peg. I, you know, I got sand in my shoe. I didn't get to sing last night. These are the kind of people that have the audacity to get up and whine and cry and say, we loathe, we hate this light bread. God has given them a miracle every morning, and angels are hand-delivering on their lawn, Pastor Lonnie. They are delivering manna for them on the lawn, and they have the audacity to tell God, we hate this light bread. You're getting a miracle every day. And the Bible said this stuff, listen to me. The Bible said this stuff had the taste of fresh oil and honeycomb. It was Krispy Kreme donuts, and angels was delivering them fresh. And the light was on. I just discovered this light thing. Y'all have Krispy Kreme out here? When, I just discovered what it means when the light's on. That means they're coming off there hot and fresh. It's like a, it's like a laser beam to me now. It's like, I'm like a lamb to the slaughter. I got to have at least a half a dozen, man, before I even get slowed up. But you got to understand that this manna was actually, if you will, this Krispy Kreme donuts is good for them. They're healthy. There's not a feeble one among them. They're losing weight. It's like if I could find the recipe to this, I am a rich man tomorrow. Because if there is a Krispy Kreme donut that will make me healthy, <laughs> I am in. And so, you know, here's Moses. He's only, and I shouldn't sidetrack on this, but here's Moses. He's, he's telling God, listen, man. I mean, they get, these people get on God's last nerve. God said to Moses, get up out the road. I, I'm, I'm going to kill every one of them. I, I'm going to kill them. And they got on my last nerve, and Moses jumps up, and Moses says, God, if you kill them, you've got to kill me too. I'm like, at about the time God said, I'm going to kill them, I'm going to say, finally, thank God. <laughs> Snuff them. Toast them bad boys. And Moses stands up as a mediator. But watch this. Moses gets clear to the end of the wilderness journey. And when he gets to the end of the wilderness journey, he fouls up one time and fails to sanctify the Lord his God before the eyes of the people, and he smites the rock rather than speak the word like God told him to. Because the first time God told him to smite the rock, the second time he told him to speak to it. There's a message in that in itself. I'm going to leave that be. But Moses smites the rock, and God said, dude, man, you know, 
you can't go in. You can't go in. I'm like, I would at this point, I'd have been, look, 120 years I got invested in this deal, and I mess up one time, and I ain't going in. See, that, that kind of, can I just, can we talk a minute? That kind of ticked me off a little bit. You know, because I'm thinking, now, God, listen, if that dude, see, what's really behind that is, listen, if Moses ain't going to make it, and he only fouled up one time, then I don't have a snowball's chance of making it. Because I've already fouled up once. Today. So I'm kind of like, you know. But see, here's the point. Yeah, exactly. That's right. But here's the point. I said, God, why? He said, because if Moses would have made it, you would have been forever destined to do it by the works of the law. And I was trying to show you that not even the mediator of that covenant could make it in by the works of the flesh. It still had to be by the hearing of faith. And so God didn't let Moses do, but 1,500 years of human history passes, and Moses is, is literally, you know, he, he's, his prayer request is ringing throughout the quarters of glory. God, let me see your glory. Show me the promised land. And 1,500 years later on a mountain called Transfiguration, God said to Michael, go get Jacob's ladder. And Moses reentered the theater of human expression on a mountain called Transfiguration. And when he came down on the mountain, he sees in the face of Jesus, and he realizes glory is not smoke in a corner. It's found in the face of Jesus Christ. And he realizes the promise. Promised land is not a place, it's a person, it's Christ. And that the only way in is through Jesus and not your works or your human efforts. And so when I showed AJ that, he was like, okay, now I'm not going to thank God I didn't throw myself off a cliff because at least I made it to that. Because see, what you got to do is finish reading the text. Because what the law was given to is to show you the utter futility of your own human possibility. And so in the middle of this context, this dude is going, I thank God I'm not like that sinner. And the other guy comes and beats on his breast and just simply says this, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he said, that man, which one? Not the holy dude, but the guy who came in who said, listen, man, I have messed up big time. I failed hugely. Man, you don't know my history. But he just simply says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he says, that guy will go in justified before the holy dude. See, I think religious people need to hear this message because they think they're making it on the basis of how their credentials are, and they read this whole list of credentials out, and God's saying, you know what, I'm not impressed. And I always thought, well, why in the middle of this God would put this text, and all of a sudden he goes into this, this deal about these little kids come to him. And he says to them, listen, suffer the little children to come to me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And all of a sudden God began to speak to me. He said, listen, man, what I'm trying to show you is that this first dude trusted in himself that he was holy. But if you don't come to the kingdom like a little child, you're not going to enter the kingdom. And I started thinking about, you know, I'm old enough now, i got grandbabies. And I started thinking about my grandbabies. I started thinking about my own kids. And I have one, you know, one of my grandkids come in at Christmas time. She's five. And she had on a shirt that said, who needs Santa Claus? I got Paw. <laughs> Buddy, she's working that too. I, I just tell you that right now. But she brought me the most precious little gift she had. She really thought this through. She couldn't wait for me to open this this little gift. But she had this little heart in this little box, and it had the little little and it had her name on the back of it. She said to me, "She said, Pat, she said I got that for you, so that whenever you are on your airplane, she thinks that's my airplane. It's not my airplane. I fly in one, but she thinks that's my airplane. And, and she just discovered the other day, she's just old enough now, she just discovered I'm on TV. She just discovered. She was in the basement watching cartoons. And when TBN will run our program as a bonus run, our DVR picks it up and kicks on and just shifts to that channel. And so all of a sudden, she's watching Doc McStuffins, and Pappy comes on TV. And she goes running into my wife's office, and she goes, Mama! you got to come in here. Pappy's on TV. No, really, Mama, he's on TV right now. you got to come in here and see this. This is Pappy. He's on television. <laughs> so, Mama says, yeah, Ellen, you know, you know, your dad, that's what he does. He produces that. When you see them go out to the TV studio, that's what they're doing. And so she's, 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 she's all excited about this. So she tells the other granddaughter that's Stu, she said, we're on the golf cart riding. And she says to me, she says, Pap, Aspen don't know a whole lot about you yet. She don't know you have an airplane, and she don't know you're on television. Because she hasn't known you near as long as I have. 
But this precious little gift she gives me, she's got this little heart with her name. And she said, so, Pap, when you're gone and you're away, she said, all you got to do is reach in this little pocket and pull that out and rub it, and you will know that I love you. Man, I got to tour up. I thought, man, I am carrying that little thing everywhere. That's the most precious gift I have, you know. But see, what we don't realize is how precious our praise is to our Heavenly Father. And just a little bit of love will take you a whole long way. If our kids ever figured this out in their teens, we'd be broke. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm telling you, these little girls come to me, Pat, you know, uh, they, they I had I shouldn't tell all these stories, but we were in Costco, and they saw one of these little castles. It looks like a little castle. And one of them, and, and I mean, just, <gasps> it just totally mesmerized. Pap, i got to have one of them. You got, I mean, she's inside of it. I ended up, had to buy two, one for one, one for the other one. <laughs> so I bought them each a castle, you know, because i got to tell you, man, i got a weakness. Pap, Pap's tore up. i just tell you right now. Invest in Walmart because the Momo and Pappy are on the loose with two grandkids. But the deal I'm pointing at is simply this. They know nothing about finances. They don't know anything about a house payment. They don't have a clue what that castle cost. They don't know nothing about, you know, uh, what it takes to drive cars. They just live in a divine if you will oblivion knowing that pap not, or not just pap but dad mom whatever you understand where i'm coming from see the point here is we come to a father a heavenly father who has unlimited resources who is absolutely head over heels in love with you come on go ahead and give him some clap is not mad at you he's mad about you who, who don't care if you understand all the cross your T's, dot your I's on how this thing works. You just know he's your daddy. And when you come like a little child, what he's saying is, what he's trying to point out here is until you either as the holy dude who thinks you're righteous on your own, or you come as the sinner who says, be merciful to me, a sinner, what he's saying is you've got to come to the kingdom like a little child. You have no resources of your own to supply any need you possibly have. So you need to come to an utter dependence on God, no matter if you think you're the holy dude or the worst guy in the room. All I came to tell you is dad wants you to crawl up in his lap and say listen i got this come on somebody help me preach just a little bit what you got to do is come like a little child and say listen i don't have no resources of my own it is humanly impossible for me to walk this walk it's not possible for me to live this life i can't say no you know i can't you know the big the big deal back sometimes just say no to drugs well if I, you could just say no to them people be saying no all the time i think the issue is say yes to jesus and i need you god and i've got another dependence on you because i can't help myself if i could have helped myself i wouldn't have needed a savior but i needed a savior so if i got a beat on my breast and i gotta say be merciful God steps in and says, this is not by your might. It's not by your power. It's not about your human performance. Hallelujah. You're my child, and I've got the divine resources, and all I'm looking for is you to come and depend on me. See, it takes me clear back to Eden's misty garden, because the whole fall came when man decided, listen, man, I'm going to declare independence again. I'm going to declare independence from God. I can do this on my own. I can eat this fruit and make myself like God. What a dumb thing, man. And we've been trying to do it ever since. And let me tell you something, man. See, addiction is simply pleasure without satisfaction. And only God can satisfy. God made you with a God-shaped void that only he can satisfy. And there's nothing that will give you satisfaction. And you might, listen, have socially acceptable addictions. You might have others that are not socially acceptable. But every person from the pulpit to the door was created to have a dependency on something. But I'm telling you, the thing you were created to have your dependency on is not yourself. It's to depend on him. Listen, I tell you, some of you that have been through rehab, if you've been through NA or you've been through alcohol or any of that stuff, they'll tell you you've got to have a higher power. And you know they'll tell you because they can't legally tell you what your higher power is. You can have a, your Chevy, your Ford, your motorcycle. But see, I ain't never seen to hardly set anybody free. The only ones I ever seen to really get free is when you said, listen, there's a God bigger than I am. 
There is a Jesus who doesn't live on a planet three miles south of Mars. He came into my life. He lives inside of me. He changes my desire. He helps me moment by moment. That's the higher power because it's not by my mind. I don't have no resources of my own. And when Jesus begins to preach like that, he said, the kingdom's like a little child. So you've got to come. Listen, this is not deep or profound. You just got to come to a place where you're dependent on me. Here's what happened in the fall. Man became alive to sin, and when he did, he became dead to God. But when you reverse that, you come back to Jesus, what you become is alive to God, you start to get dead to sin. Are you hearing where I'm coming from? And you start to get this satisfaction. And your nature gets changed because God don't just give you a bunch of rules you got to keep. See, the gospel is not about a law you have to keep. It's about receiving a life that will keep you. It's not, living about, it's not living from rules on rocks. It's living out of a relationship. It's not walking by fear, it's walking by faith. I love that, hallelujah. And so, you know, in this whole t turnabout, we, we, we simply become alive to God. And Lonnie and I were talking, I said, you know what? When you get born again, I, I like to stress this word. You get regenerated, regenerated. You get a new genetic, you get a new nature. And how many of you, let me just ask you this question. How many of you besides me, have tried to sin since you've been saved. Now, now we don't have to hide. I'm going to raise both hands here in a minute. <laughs> How many found out once you got born again and Jesus was living in you, it wasn't as fun as it used to be? And you're sitting there trying to act like you're the life of the party, and it's like, man, I don't know how everybody seems like they're having fun, but I am miserable up in here. You know why? It ain't your nature to sin anymore. You almost got to force yourself to. You got it's what it is is a learned pattern of behavior that can be broken. There are cycles that can be broken because Jesus simply breaks in to break the cycle, and He steps in and says, "I'm going to divinely interrupt your life." And let me tell you something: even when you don't, He don't leave you or forsake you. Hallelujah! God, see, and I've said this all over the world, but God's a stalker. He follows you. He sits there. Are you done yet? Have you messed your life up enough? He's like Forrest Gump. He'll take you back when all you got's one dying breath because stupid is what stupid does. But the reality of it is you could have had a whole entire lifetime of unconditional love and enjoying this journey because what God wants to do for you is give you this incredible abundant life and see Deuteronomy 10 said I want to give you the days of heaven on earth I want you to live in the kingdom and he told them when he got off the boat in uh, when Je in Genesis where they got off the boat with Noah he said listen the, the message Bible said I want you to live lavishly I, I want you to have the best life on the planet see hell's not where you go when you die hell's where you what, what you already experienced when you're separate from the presence of God And I, I'm not sure God created it. I think we did. Come on, somebody, you're either raising hell or you're bringing down heaven. I don't know, you know, you preach it one way or the other. But the reality of it is, is that, listen, he's trying to give you the best life on the planet. So he said, I came, listen, he didn't say I came to give you a ticket to heaven and to get out of hell free card. He said, I came to give you, uh, I came to give you life in that more abundantly. I came to give you life. Touch somebody say, you need to get a life. Are you hearing where I'm coming from? And then, listen, he goes on down. I need to probably cut to the fat here real quick here, but let me go back over here to where I'm reading from because right in the middle of this, I, in the, uh, this story changes. And he comes to this rich young ruler. He said there was a certain ruler. Ask him, saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit? Watch the question. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but, God, but one, and that is God. In other words, Jesus has said, see, I'm living out of the same dependence you are. I'm dependent on the Father. And you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things have I kept from my youth up. Jesus, so when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. You have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he became sorrowful, he said, How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, Who then can be saved? But he said, The things which are impossible with God are possible with men. Then Peter said, You see, 
we have left all to follow you. And he said to them, Assuredly, I said to you, there is no one that's left houses or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. And all of a sudden, Jesus is turned around. He said, and he turns around and he says, there's this rich young ruler comes to him and says, listen, what must I do to be saved? Now, that's the question is, what do I got to do? So he's asking Jesus. Now, I don't know if I, I think you probably may understand this or may not. I'll try to make it as clear as I can. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are in the New Testament, but they are still in the Old Covenant. And the reason that is is because Jesus had not yet been sacrificed and the new covenant has not been inaugurated. So they're asking Jesus, what do I have to do to get eternal life? So he starts giving them the rules. So if you're going to ask him what i got to do, he's going to say, okay, if you want to do this through performance, then here's what you got to do. And he gives him the rules. And the guy comes down and said, all of this have I done from my youth up. And he said, what one thing you lack? Because how many know if you are up under law and rules and performance... There's always one thing you lack. See, I was raised in classical Pentecost under what I call terrorist preachers. They were the dudes that would dangle you over hell every time you came and invited you to a last day barbecue and talk you out, out of your salvation constantly, you know. And then it would always be about the time I thought I was saved and I don't need to come to the altar again. They'd come up with another sin. One thing thou lackest. Ha! And you got to hack when you do that. One thing thou lackest. Ah. <laughs> and they terrorize you, man. They, they, and I think, man, I thought I was meeting the criteria. I didn't think I was going to have to get saved this morning. But now they done changed the rules on me. They upped the ante. I'm lost again. And I'm like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just tired of this religious treadmill. You hear where I'm coming from? Because under law, under performance-based religion, you always lack one thing. And so when Jesus is talking to this dude, I don't think he's really saying to him, if you've got money, you can't make it. What he's saying is, you're blessed when you're poor in spirit. What do you mean? You, you realize that where God is concerned, you have a need. Because when you think you are rich and increased in goods, and that's not necessarily possessions or money. Listen, I don't think Jesus was poor. And, and I, I, I could side path. Let me just say this, because I think I need to probably say this. When, when those wise men came from the east and brought him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, we somehow have in our mind, we got these three little guys coming with a little knapsack full of gold, frankincense, and myrrh because of the Christmas play we saw where we only got three boys in the church. We're going to put them in a, put a towel on their head in the bathroom, <laughs> robe on them, and they're broken. They're going to play their drum for him, rump a pum pum because they're... And it paints this picture in our mind of these three little guys, you know, who are broke and they got a few pennies in a bag. No, no. These were kings who had looked for him for several years. And when a king came to see another king to honor him, they didn't bring him a tip, man. The queen of Sheba, when she came to see Solomon, get this, the queen of Sheba brought Solomon a $52,800,000 offering just in gold in that economy. Solomon builds a gold temple. Y'all help me just a little. Think about this. So here's these kings. They bring Jesus, I believe, enough wealth to keep him while he has to flee into Egypt. He comes back from there after Herod is dead. He runs a 33-and-a-half-year ministry with 12 men on staff, and one of them is an embezzler, and nobody's missing the money. <laughs> Judas is a thief. I feel at home up in here tonight. Hallelujah. That's what the Bible said. Jesus, Jesus put him on, he put him on staff as the treasurer. He knew he was a thief. But see the <laughs> So 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 some and, and so his his gown was so valuable that they cast lots for it when he died. What I'm trying to say is Jesus wasn't poor. And so, you know, we, we think in terms of poverty, but what I what I'm after is not wrong to be wealthy. God wants to bless his people. I think he, so what he's saying is hard for a rich man in the kingdom. He's talking about when you trust in your own abilities to supply for yourself. See, here's the context. 
I thank God I'm not like that guy. And I, I, I thank God, listen, I, I'm not, I can't come like a little child because, listen, I'm a self-made. Look how holy I am. I thank God. I'm holy and I'm not like that. You, know, you understand what I'm coming? He's trusting in his own ability and Jesus is pointing to this guy. He said, listen, if you think you're rich and increased in goods, it's hard for you to enter the kingdom because the only way you're going to come into the kingdom is when you realize how utterly and completely bankrupt, busted, broke you are spiritually and that you're going to have to depend on a divine source that's outside of yourself, that this is not about you. Man, I love this. This is so liberating to me. It's not about you. It's not about how good you are. It's not about whether you... Come Come on, you, you did all the rules because this guy didn't make it in based on the rules. He went away sorrowful. Jesus said, man, it's hard. It'd be easy for a camel. But why want you to go one chapter later? See, this is, we read it, but we don't read context. Next chapter, he said, then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was the chief tax collector and he was rich. This is the dude that they was just pointing at back there when he said, I thank God I'm not like that sinner, that tax collector. This is the dude. This is the guy they all hate. I thank God I'm not like that sinner. He, you know. Of course, I'm not happy with tax collectors either, but we'll just leave that. <laughs> I loved your joke, man. If the federal government took over the Sahara Desert, they'd run out of sand in five years. That's just too good. Somebody got to post that on Facebook somewhere. <laughs> but the Bible said this, this guy was a tax He's everything they hate. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. But look at this guy. But he sought to see Jesus, who he was, but could not because of the crowd. For he was of short stature. You know, I, I sometimes wonder, you know, some, some translations say he was a wee little man. I sometimes wonder, Pastor Lonnie, if he was really a wee little man. Well, that's just how he felt about himself because of all the religious dudes pointing at him and saying, listen, man, you're worthless. See, I, I, there are probably people sitting in this room tonight and you feel like you feel little. You know, that's one of the things, even the reason I, I'm not even big about people calling me Dr. House. And I, I did earn that, and, and, and that's not, but that's really not, a, it's really not a thing to me. Because I don't want people to think, man, I feel like I'm any better than they are, because without Jesus, we are all absolutely and totally, completely lost. And, and you know, when, when, when this guy, I, I'm sure that probably he'd been around people made him feel so wee little. I mean, you know, sometimes I feel like a hot dog at a steak buffet, to be honest with you. Or a Krispy Kreme donut at a Weight Watchers convention. <laughs> I mean, how, how many have ever felt like that? I just feel like, I, I mean, you know, especially you get around, I mean, you know, what? I, I, there's probably nobody in this room ever got around religious dudes, and you didn't feel like, boy, I feel like a, I'm a, I'm a dirtbag. I mean, you just feel like I just don't belong here, or whatever. I think that's a sad tragedy. I, I don't not. In other words, I'm not sure that Zacchaeus was really a wee little man, or that's just how he felt because of how religion had done him. But I love this thing about him. He said he wanted to see Jesus, who he was. That's all he wanted. He went so, so he ran before, and he climbs up in this sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw and s saw him, and he said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today. I must abide at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained. That's the dude's point at him early, saying he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, look, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor. And if I had taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I'm going to restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, here's a powerful thought to me. As I thought about this, there's a lot of places I could go with this, but I'm going to I'm going to wind it up here, here pretty quick. Zacchaeus climbs up in a sycamore tree. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but the sycamore tree here in other translations is an inferior fig tree. You say, well, what's important about that? The fig tree 
was the tree that Adam used to cover his nakedness up. It was religious apron. Now, how many know an apron? How many remember that Adam made an apron? He said, God, listen, the moment he got information about good and evil, which is the law, it's religion. He, instead of running to God, he runs from God, and he goes like, listen, look, I'm naked, I'm ashamed, and I need to hide. And God was chasing him. God was a stalker. People say, if you sin, God will leave you. He didn't leave Adam. He chased him. Where are you, Adam? And Adam made a, 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 an apron. He said, I'm naked, I'm ashamed, I need to hide. And, and I can hear God chasing him going, listen, listen, man, you was naked day before yesterday. It didn't bother me then. What makes you think it's bothering me now? But it's bothering you because you got a sin consciousness. And you think your sin keeps me from loving on you. Oh, man. And what we do is we unplug from this divine source that keeps us from sinning, and it's a, it's a perpetual failure, success, failure, success. And so he makes an apron, but the only problem with an apron is it can only put up a good front. So if you've got an apron on its front, you just hope nobody ever sees you turn around. <laughs> or that them leaves get crispy. It would be a bad day. I could sing a song here, but I'll leave it be. And so God says to him, he climbed up in this inferior fig tree. And what I think this is talking about is more than just some tree somewhere. He had climbed up in this religious tree that had made him feel so little and so small and so rejected because he was in an inferior fig tree. And when Jesus comes, I hear him scream. I hear him scream into the church everywhere, come down out of that tree come down out of that fig tree that religious system that has kept you embarrassed has kept you ashamed has kept you hidden kept you running from god thinking he's not interested in you that points to you and says i thank god i'm not like that guy that's the guy jesus wants to go home with man i got some good news for some of you tonight you're the guy or the gal that Jesus says, I must abide at your house today. Now, let me tell you, I'm not talking about the one where your address is at. I'm talking about, he said, I must abide at your house. And, man, it just aggravates these religious dudes. These holy dudes, their, their carnal mind goes out to safety zone. He has gone to be a friend with sinners, man. See, because I think that's where Jesus shows up. Is for, he shows up where people recognize they have a need. For people who come like a little child, that even the scribes and Pharisees, they're going to push the kids away. He said, listen, they're, they're, they said, don't bother him. No, no, Jesus said, let them, let them come. The ones who want to crawl up in my lap, let them come. Let them come. I don't care how messed up you are. Let them come. Are you hearing where I'm coming from? Because that's, you're the one he wants to go home with. And I love this story because the Bible says that Zacchaeus then, now watch this, Jesus, he didn't ask Jesus, what do I got to do? What's the rules? Jesus just says, I'm coming to your house. And the dude gets up the next day and he goes, you know what, Lord? If I've wronged anybody, I'm going to restore full fold. Now, see, Jesus didn't tell him to do that. Jesus didn't ask him. To, he said, I'm going to give half my goods to the poor. Jesus didn't ask him to do, give a penny away. Now, remember the other rich dude? He, Jesus said, you got to sell all you got. And the guy can't give up a penny under law. He went away sorrowful because he was very rich. And he says, I, I'm not giving up a penny. And here's Jesus who don't ask this guy for nothing. He comes and says, man, hey, when Jesus came in, I just got real generous. I'm going to give half my stuff away. You know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to sell it. I'm going to give, if I've done anybody wrong. In other words, he starts to change without the pressure. And then Jesus turns around, not because he did that, but because that was the result of Jesus coming to his house. He says, this day salvation has come to this house because this man also is a son of Abraham. There are some of you in this room that don't think you're sons and daughters of God, but I came to tell you, you're also sons and daughters of God. 
Stand on your feet all over this building. I need to bring it in for close because I know that there's a certain time limit on your stand on, I'm done anyway. Stand on your feet if you would for a moment. To me, that's just so powerful, man. That, that is just so powerful that we're sons and daughters of God. And he says, you know, to them, listen, this, today, this day, salvation has come to this house because he also is a son or daughter of Abraham. And I, I believe there are sons and daughters of Abraham here today who don't know that, that they're sons and daughters. I, I think so many times even the prodigal son, and I, I probably shouldn't even chase this rabbit a little bit, but the one comes back from the hog pen and he says, you know, Father, I, I, I betrayed you. And he said, you know, just make me a servant. And the father said, listen, man, bring a ring, put it on his finger, put shoes on his feet. Because God was trying to get him to lose his servant mentality and understand he was a son. But he came back and said, I'm a servant. And then there was the other son that was in the house. He said, Father, I have served you my whole life, and you never once gave me a fat calf to make merry with my friends. And the father says, see, here's the point, boys, neither one of you. You both got a servant mentality, and I'm trying to get you to understand you're not servants, you're sons. You're sons, and if you're heirs, sons, you're heirs. And if you're heirs, come on, dad cares. So when I'm standing here tonight in ministry, I'm thinking to myself, if you're standing here tonight and you say, God, I just have some things I need. There's some stuff I cannot handle on my own. Welcome to the party. You just got to a good place. We just got, come on, when you get to the place where you can't do it no more, you're out on the limb of faith. You know, we, we, we've been doing television now for, this is our sixth year. We're about to go off of the church channel, but because we're going off the church channel, we're going to go on, instead of going off of one, we're going on three more. So we'll be on three networks the, about the fifth or the second week of June. We're going to be on Impact. We're going to be on uh, Uplift, and we're going to be on GEB. And all of them are on Dish, Direct, and a bunch of cable markets. But we got out on a limb where this is beyond what I can do on my own. And I'm just talking about my journey. I'm not saying that about anything. I'm not getting ready to take it off. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm trying to get you to say, you see, is that there's a whole lot of stuff in different areas of our lives well, we just got to get the place to say, man, this is out of my control. I, I don't have no resources of my own. Dad, are you hear where I'm coming from? Listen, come on. Who needs Santa Claus? I got, I got Jesus, man. Come on, somebody. Hear what I'm saying. No matter if it's a struggle with addiction, a struggle with what you're going through in your life, a struggle in your marriage, struggle in your, it's this simple got to come like a little child say I, I'm, I'm poor in spirit I, ha I have a need where God's concerned and I have never been to where I didn't feel like I utterly and completely was dependent on him so that's a bad place no it's a really good one because when you get there that's when God rolls up his sleeve and say now watch this because I'm going to do exceedingly above all you can ask or think according to the power that's at work in you Jesus wants to go to your house lift your hands let's pray a minute i gotta get, i gotta get out your road here tonight father in jesus name we stand here tonight all over this room lord there are people maybe there are people in here tonight and they have never asked jesus to go home with them if you haven't just say lord i want you to abide at my house and i'll tell you what man he will move in here's the here's the thing again the bible said there is therefore now no condemnation. And when I think about the term condemnation, I think about in my area there was some earthquakes back some time ago, and they, there were houses that they said were condemned. That means they're uninhabitable. But see, if there's therefore now no condemnation, that means you're still inhabitable. You hear me? So your house is not condemned. It's inhabitable. And I like how Revelation says, it says, look, look, God has moved into the neighborhood. And when God moves in the neighborhood, property values go up. But he moves in, and he takes over. I receive it, Lord. Come on, let's pray again. I need to get you out of here because we're running out of time. But, Father, I thank you, and I receive from you. And I'm not counting on my own riches. I'm not counting on my own abilities. I'm not counting on any of that. But I need you as my Abba, my Daddy God, my Father. And I trust you that just like I care about my kids and my grandkids, you care about us. So we cast our care on you, and we just say, live in my house. I'm coming down out of that tree, hallelujah, to let you abide in me. In Jesus' name, 
Amen and amen. Pastor Lonnie, come on. Well, that was quite a word. So you're coming out of that religious tree and taking Jesus home, right? <laughs> God bless you, brother. Thanks for taking time out and, and coming up tonight, too, Lynn. We, and I will update you as because he's still in the process of signing contracts, and so I'll let you all know. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, this one will be on our website next week with a blog. So, <laughs> so anyway, if I get ushers uh, to uh, go back and uh, you receive that anointing, and when you uh, join in with that and you agree with it, and then you sow something into it, there's an attachment there too. And so I I ask that you just uh, give tonight and just bless Lynn. He's just not uh, a minister that when he comes to town, we want to have him, but he's our friend, he's our partner, and we want to support everything that he's doing. And like I said earlier, uh, there's not a whole lot of people on this planet that will just bring the word of God and the kingdom like he does. And now you heard it all yourself. So let's, let's support this and, uh, and bring our offering. And Let's just pray right now. Father, we just thank you for Lynn and, and all that he does and this anointing that he brings. The world is in need to hear the truth of the gospel. And so, Father, I pray that you just continue to open doors for him wherever he goes, television, wherever it is. Father, across this globe so that people can hear this message, a much-needed message that is bringing freedom, bringing a spiritual reality to your church and bringing people into freedom. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on ahead. What do you think I was going to do, sing a song? <laughs> if you have visited here tonight and this is your first time, and if you like what you heard, come on back. Every Friday night right here. <laughs>